Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 881. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 24th, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here. As you can see, George is, uh, he was holding his dog a moment ago. Apparently, you're having a clothing drop off uh, today at church, and people are knocking on the door, walking by your window, and your poor little pooch is going crazy. So, uh, we're, we're going to introduce that in our intro. So, people, if they hear a dog in the background further down the episode, it's Tara, the guard dog. George, uh, I was watching Governor DeSantos this morning, the governor of Florida, and he says, doom, there's a hurricane coming. And I looked on the map and it says it's dead center for Lucanto, Florida. Uh, What's going on? We are in the uh, bullseye of this uh, storm that's going to come ashore late Wednesday night, Thursday morning. It's uh, heading up between Cuba and Yucatan right now. And uh, we'll see. Uh, we should get about twelve feet of uh, twelve feet of uh, Flood uh, stage, yeah. storm surge, storm yeah. surge, where the uh, water will be twelve feet higher than normal. Now we're about oh sixty, seventy, eighty feet up here, so oh, we'll be yeah. fine. But the winds are our problem. This yeah. morning, uh, the men's group went around tying everything down, and uh, we just got in this uh, clothing shed where people can come up and drop off uh, used clothing, and <laughs> Uh, it was just watch. It's like watching the Three Stooges because you know they're trying to drive in uh, metal uh, bolts it pins, into yeah. asphalt, <laughs> and you know asphalt's not concrete. Asphalt breaks. You know it, it's not. So and, and th- here's the thing: is I can't say a word because you know I've got to be encouraging and thanking them for their volunteering and let them figure it out. And if mm-hmm. and if after the storm we've got to shed up side down somewhere i can't say a word hold on but they love doing it they love going out there playing with the tools driving uh bolts and uh, pins into the uh asphalt Uh, you know i i love men's group at our church so let's talk a little bit about the logistics here i have lived in florida now since 21 have been through a couple hurricanes and there's in my mind there's two types of hurricanes in florida there's the one that you hear about it two weeks out and it just slowly builds and comes, comes ashore. And even though it's two weeks out, you don't even know what side of the Florida is going to hit yet. Um, it's coming over there from the Bahamas somewhere. And then there's the one that instantly appears just south of the Gulf of Mexico. And it is a day and a half away. And that's what we have now is the, the day and a half away hurricane. Um, you've been through several as you lost a house in a hurricane. Um, tell me a little about the preparation. I'm sorry, tell me. Tell me about a little the, about how you prepare uh, a church and your, your yourself for a hurricane. I don't really prepare. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we, in in 2000, 2000, 2000, longtime viewers will remember when our house was knocked down. Mm. Uh, I think it was 2004. Were we on film? Well, no, we weren't on film yet, but yeah. 2004, our house was destroyed when we lived in Vero. Uh, but you know, preparing there, um, we lived on the barrier island, and that meant putting up uh, plywood and uh, shutters and uh, really, really taking measures against both wind and water. Mm. Uh, because uh, wind, you know, even though the sea will rise, the pr- real problem is the accumulation of floodwaters and rainwaters. Mm. Here on the West Coast and at elevation, we have no water real issues. The guys down on the coast do. We're about five, six miles from the coast, but we're up high. So our issue is wind. So what I do is make sure that I park the old junker underneath the tree to make sure that the branches come down and I can collect on the insurance, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> but actually, most of my most of my preparation is, is checking with the shut-ins and the older people sure. who may not have the wherewithal or the strength to move in furniture and to prepare so yeah. that's what the men's group does on these days. They go around and and uh, help help our little old ladies move porch furniture and and uh, find the cat and make sure it's inside. Yeah, with Sasquatch, our RV, we just wanted to be sure it was parked into the wind. 
um, and that we had the uh, we lift up the jacks so that the, the wind would be affected by our shocks and uh, it, it would take less stress off the RV. But you know that's that's kind of life in the South. You know, you, you, you get hurt. We, we have a we have a number of people who live in mobile homes and uh, and uh, in uh, and they've got to leave. There's no mm. ifs ands or buts because yeah. the wind will pick them up, pick up the mobile homes and flip them over. So, yeah. there you now go. and every once in a while, uh, like every third hurricane, they do give evacuation orders. They say this county okay. needs to evacuate, um, and that's certainly something that could happen with you. But you are higher ground in Lakanto, uh, in Webster, we're at like a hundred feet uh, above ground. But anybody in the low lying areas, uh, especially viewers of the show, if you get the the order to evacuate, please do. Let's move on to the news. I spent a little bit more time in our pre-show here because we only have six stories today. I'm sorry, but uh, thankfully, uh, people have come through. Now, uh, (laughs) (laughs) bye-bye, Pooch. So let's talk about... uh, um, uh, she Pope thinks Francis. I've been talking to her all this time. So. <laughs> she does. Let, let's talk a little bit about Pope Francis. Since the beginning, you and I have said Pope Francis is an Episcopal wannabe. I don't know why he does not have an honorary degree yet from VTS or Swanee, but um, certainly his idea of church leadership and uh, uh, you know what the church is for is a little different than your normal Roman Catholic ethos. Uh, especially from previous popes. Uh, and we'll talk the same about Welby. Welby is a pope wannabe. And uh, uh, that's going to be certainly part of our discussion here. Uh, there is a penitential celebration at the start of Synod and a part... Um, I read your sentence wrong. Uh, Francis has seven new sins. Let's talk about those, George. The... Uh some people, when I some people thought this was a hoax, but actually, yeah. the Vatican has put out a preparatory document for a penitential celebration at the start of the Synod on Synodality. That's fine. Uh, we have okay. penitential services all the time in the prayer book, and we do it in Lent and everything. And there was an explanation that this is quote intended to direct the work of Synod towards the beginning of a new way of being church. Now. We're starting to hear bells go off if you are a traditional Catholic or if you're just a normal person. Catholic Church has to do begin a new way of doing church, which means that the old way is wrong. And part of the whole Catholic uh, liberal ethos is that the Catholic Church is anti-pastoral, that all of its rules and regulations and doctrines and teachings are anti-human, which of course I believe is nonsense. Mm-hmm. But this is in that trajectory. So my, and then it goes on to say that the goal of this penitential celebration is the experience of feeling pain and even shame for our sins and perhaps the sins of others. Okay, we're going down to Episcopal, Episcopal 101 in here. Uh, I don't know whether we're going to have a weekly uh, segment on Pope Francis is the secret Episcopalian, but here's another episode. We're going to apologize for other people's sins in the past. So we're going to apologize for the slave trade. We're going to apologize for the Inquisition. We're going to apologize for exploiting, you know, women. In other words, we're going to apologize and feel badly for the sins of other people. And it closes with the admonition that the request for forgiveness is the first step of a faith-filled and missionary credibility that must be reestablished. Francis is telling us that the credibility of the Catholic Church and its missionary outreach must be reestablished. Now, what does that mean? It means that it currently has failed. So, this is something straight out of a Lambeth conference or out of an Episcopal church or general convention or a church of england house of bishops meeting where it's woke anti-western anti-white anti-historical anti-colonialist self-flagellation and 
Yeah, I'll give you an example, two of the seven sins. That's not our normal sins, but one is the sin of using doctrine as stones to be hurled. No. This is where people thought at first this was uh, a joke. In other words, it's like, so we're going to condemn Athanasius for debating with people over things. Or that conservative Catholic bishop who refuses to give communion yeah, to yeah. a pro-abortion politician. Yeah. Or uh, the Catholic commentators and bloggers who tell us, or the commentators on our uh, YouTube channel who tell us that you guys just don't understand Mary. Friends, Francis says, don't hurl stones at doctrines of Kevin and George anymore. Yeah. We're, we're nice guys. Yeah. And the last, and another one is sin against synodality. The lack of listening, communion, and participation of all. In Daba. In yeah. Daba. Yeah. This yeah. is in Daba. Talk just to talk so until you wear out the conservatives, till they throw up their hands and say, the hell with it. Whatever you want to do, I want to go to sleep. Of bringing in teenagers to give them to give them a voice in the councils of the church. Well, friends, this was you know they tried the voice of youth in the '60s and '70s, and that was a total failure. Yeah, I mean, and, wasn't it Jack Weinberg who said, "Don't listen to anybody above 30? That didn't work. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and, you know, but you know, it's one thing. It's one thing for a loopy doopy national province like the Germans or something in the Catholic Church to do this stuff. But this is the Synod and Synodality, and this is guiding the Catholic Church into a new era. They mm -hmm. are saying we are thinking of new ways of being church. And this new way of being church, if you disagree with the synodical way, you're a heretic. If you bring up arguments of doctrine and discipline, if you cite the catechism to say you can't do that or say that. In other words, if you say to Francis, Francis, not always lead to God. You can't be a Buddhist and a Hindu or an atheist and know and come to the Father, which is what Francis said in Singapore last week. Okay. Well, if the response is that's a sin of using doctrine as a stone to be hurled. It, I'm not a Roman Catholic. But I rely upon the Catholic Church to be. I agree, the Catholic Church is a is a bona fide church. I believe you can be a Catholic and go to heaven. Sure, um, I, I'm not one of these nut jobs, you know, Fred Felt types that says the only people who go to heaven are the members of my church. I don't believe that at all. But I do rely upon the Catholic Church to maintain a degree of decency and integrity, so that when the Episcopalians go off the rails we have an ally that we can gradually bring the church back onto safe ground. But, but now, they're, they're, they're the Catholic Church is running faster than the Episcopal Church. They're repeating the mistakes that obviously the Episcopal Church made and so many others. They, they woke up and they realized something's not working. We're not filling our churches. We're not leading people to a uh, relationship with the Father. We're doing it wrong. And instead of returning to a time when they were doing it right, instead of a time when they were re really preaching the gospel and really uh, caring about the people, they're inventing something brand new. We need to invent a new church. And as we see with the Episcopal Church and others, that doesn't work. You can't uh, throw out your doctrine, you can't throw out the gospel, you can't throw out who Jesus really is and expect people to come to church and worship the Father. Uh, they, they want you to return to the old church. They want you to return to a time when the church was there for the people and not there for itself. And yeah, we're not there. Yeah. Carol, the patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church, gave a very important speech uh, the other day. And he's starting to theologically separate the Putin regime from the Russian Orthodox Church. Because the last two and a half years of the Ukraine war, they based the Orthodox Church was a an instrument of Russian policy, and he's saying we have to rethink what orthodoxy means and what the Russian Orthodox Church needs to tell the world is that it is the touchstone, its doctrines about the uh, Jesus and morals and. Uh, will not change no matter which way the world goes. The world may say abortion transgenderism, homosexuality, 
all of these things may be normalized in the West, but the Russian Orthodox Church will remain faithful to the faith once given to the saints. And Kirill is, you know, the Russians have long said the Episcopalians have lost the plot. Uh, and now they're saying that Roman Catholics have lost the plot. Um, it is telling that a few years ago, the, the Russian Orthodox began to talk to the ACNA and to the GAFCON people. I don't know whatever happened with that, but... War. War. Yeah. I mean, well, war is a great divider. Yeah, and I, I just want to take us back to what worked in the beginning. Okay, we have great examples all the way through Acts uh, up until you know, many centuries ago of a cohesive working church that you know certainly needed reform throughout the years. And uh, um, but I would go look back in your history more than I would look forward, George. Just saying, got to be something there. All right, let's move on uh, to a topic that we kind of discussed, like a sentence so, or two. Kevin, oh, yeah. Kevin, I'm j I just you you go want ahead. me to be a Mia, make Episcopalians great again? Uh, yeah, okay, uh, go for it. Try uh, it. A Mia, I got a red hat. Mia, make Episcopalians Miga. great again. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Let's go talk about Rwanda. I think I thought we mentioned this in a sentence or two a couple episodes ago, but uh, people in the comments said, hey, you haven't talked about Rwanda yet. So the Rwanda government has closed 8,000 churches. Now, other governments have cl uh, closed churches, but they're kind of doing it for a different reason. And I thought we could talk a little bit about this, but um, Rwanda and many countries in Africa have a prosperity gospel problem. And they have a uh, not a house church problem, but a set up and go problem. Well, a church will appear uh, in a town for a couple weeks, uh, gather the money, uh, um, proclaim a couple prophets, set them uh, amongst each other, and leave. And Rwanda is trying to deal with that. Now, is this nefarious? I don't think so. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the history of Wanda to, to let you think it's not the theorious. What's What is going on as far as the government's concerned, George? The Rwandan government has closed, uh, recently closed 8,000 congregations, churches. And they passed a series of laws saying a church to operate lawfully or a mosque or a temple must have uh, certain things. They must be registered with the government as a corporation. They must have officers or wardens. Their clergy must be educated. You cannot proclaim yourself a prophet and walk in off the fields. You have to have a degree of training or preparation. That doesn't mean a four-year college degree and three years of seminary, but you just can't, you know, you, you just can't start something that way. You uh, have to have a permanent structure. You can't operate out of a truck or a tent or in the forest, you have to have a building. Now, and you must, and this building must have toilets, it must have sanitation. Rwanda is a very structured society. I was there for the uh, GAFCON yeah. conference. And I have to tell you, it is unlike Kenya or Tanzania or the other places I've been in Africa, Nigeria, no street children, it's very clean. There's no trash in the streets. Kigali is, nicer looking than uh, most European cities, certainly cleaner. It's certainly more well organized and ordered. That's just the way the government is. It's a benign dictatorship. It's like Singapore. And in the United States, anybody can open up a, in a strip mall and have the first apostolic church of prophecy next to the dollar general. And that's fine. Well, no, the, 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 hold on up to a point. You still have to register your church if you want a not-for-profit status, if you're going to collect money. I mean, there, there are things our government requires of churches. Um, but yeah, you can you can have uh, your tent revivals if you want. The uh, Rwandan government is not acting against doctrine, per se. So, in other words, because if they did, then they'd close all the mosques, close all the Catholic yeah. churches, or close all the Anglican churches and favor one particular group. The Roman Catholics are the largest, the Anglicans are the second largest. They're about almost the same size these days, like Uganda. The Anglicans have really grown tr dramatically. And there's mm -hmm. a small Muslim minority, and then there are Adventists and other groups. And 
But the key is order and to prevent what happened in Kenya. From earlier this year, there was a Kenyan cult where its members starved themselves to death. There were like three or 400 people who had starved themselves to death because the pastor told them that this is what God wanted from them. So the target is fraudsters, really. The target is disorder. And the experience of the genocide really does color everything in Rwanda because many of the churches were cheerleaders for the genocide. Mm -hmm. And so the churches, there were one or two Anglican bishops who were uh, compromised by the genocide. Roman Catholic, Catholic. Nobody was clean. Roman Catholic clergy. I mean, nobody was clean. Everybody was Mm -hmm. dirty. Not everybody was dirty, but every denomination had their bad apples. And the Rwandan government wants to ensure that nothing like that ever happens again. If you promote, you know, Hutu ideology, uh, you will be arrested. And so they, and so you, there's not freedom of speech the way we have in the United States. If I say Joe Biden's a skunk, nobody, nobody cares. If I say President Kagame is a skunk, I'll get a knock on the door. That's just the way you've got Rwanda is. And there's, so is this wonderful? If the United States, I'd be frightened, but this is not a case like in Nicaragua where the shirt where the government is trying to destroy anything that is not from the government rather they just want to make sure there's order and discipline run your churches effectively promote the general well-being whatever you believe is fine but you know well i think we're in the forms do what you need to do have have toilet paper in the ladies room nicaragua also wants to take the assets of the church this is, you know, yeah. I don't think Rwanda is taking any churches that have assets. Uh, they're trying to, uh, you know, be careful uh, and respectful. And like you said, Kigali is a clean city. Kigali is an amazing place. And uh, the uh, province, of, the Anglican province there, owns an office building where they, they are, uh, the rent from that comes and supports the province. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's a, a, a different society, to say the least. I don't think there's anything nefarious here but you know, you go back to the rwanda genocide there was a time that there was a great uh uh ev- evangelical movement in rwanda but it was said that it was uh, a thousand miles wide and an inch deep there was no, no mm-hmm. theological backing to it so it was very easy for the genocide to take place um now this is way back in my memory uh i haven't kept up on the latest rwanda politics but you know, I think they want to be safe. They want to, you know, be sure that this is done uh, in, in a safe way because in the past, religion has been a problem for them. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, uh, well, you go to some place like Singapore, which is in many ways like uh, Rwanda mm-hmm. because it's an authoritarian democratic state and the people vote for the authoritarian dictator. It's not that they he's like an it. unelected yeah. dictator. They like it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, if you spit on the sidewalk in Singapore, you are going to be arrested. Uh, their rules, you know, are very strict and stringent. And they, people of Singapore support this because they see the chaos that you, they see in the rest of Southeast Asia. The Rwandans see the chaos that they see in the rest of Africa and like an authoritarian regimented regime. I would not want that for the United States. But no, I'm no, a little loath to beat them up over it for being huh. not being Americans. I have a friend on Facebook who's from Singapore, and she's lived there her whole life. And I met her when I went to Singapore with uh, many other people when I was there for the South to South conference uh, years ago. And uh, um, she freaked out about three weeks ago on Facebook when she found a piece of gum on a sidewalk. What is happening to our society? <laughs> it's all falling apart. I'm like, well, you know, that's a higher standard than we have here in America. So, uh, you know, it, it is what it is, George. And uh, if they're comfortable with it and, they, and, and, and it helps their society and they're voting for it, that's fine with me. Uh, let's talk about the uh, latest Nigerian standing committee meeting. They talked about everything under the sun happening in their country except for Justin Welby and Anglican Communion, and anything outside their borders, George? Yeah, this is a uh, 
this is what we saw the Ugandan Standing Committee, which is their convention where you have clergy, yeah. bishops, lay deputies. Um, they talked about corruption. They talked about crime. They talked about economic stagnation. They talked about political chaos. A dam burst in the northern uh, province of Borno, and it's flooded the city of Maduguri. And the reason why the dam burst is because of uh, poor corruption. maintenance by the government. Yeah. Uh, corruption, you know, nobody, people get pay, are paid to look after the dam, but nobody did anything. Not one single word in the published documents about the wider Anglican world. Now, why is that? Could it be that there's nothing on the horizon? No, the, the, this is a part of the Nigerians see themselves as part of the Anglican world most, most uh, truly. But the Welby world, that bus left, you know, they got off that bus a long time ago. Absolutely. The, the they, continued they're... decline of the international Anglican institutions centered in Justin Welby in London. Your it's average obviously. Nigerian bishop is well aware of what's happening internationally in Anglican politics. They know what the Episcopal Church is up to. They know what uh, the Church of England is up to. They're very uh, versed in LLF, and they're sick and tired of it. You know, uh, And it does no good to their country to tell anybody that, hey, Justin Welby's on our side. The Episcopal Church is on our side. You know, it, It's useless in Nigeria to say that. Um, so, the Hi. the we, we're in a we t earlier talked about Francis. One of the things that Justin Welby has been trying to do throughout his tenure is to centralize and pull more and more and more authority back into the center, into the institutions of the Archbishop, his Council, the unelected bureau bureaucrats. You know, last week we talked about how. The bishops threw a snit because the uh, election process for bishops isn't working. So their answer is to take it out of the control of lay people and the Crown Nomination Committee and give more power to the bishops. Give more power okay. to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh -huh. You know, what's happening in England is happening on the wider international Anglican front, you know, trying to give more and more authority to Welby and make him more than a first among equals. Well, the Africans have, by and large, walked away from this. Yeah, they'll send delegates to ACC meetings, and the people get a free junket out of it. They get to travel. They get to sit through interminable meetings. But it's a nice vacation. It's a little different. But it has no meaning and has no purpose anymore. The um, We're rudderless and leaderless in spite of what Justin Welby and company have sought to do. Um, people have rejected him, and I mean, we've been Kevin. You and I have been talking about this for almost ten years now. Yeah. Um, but the uh, we just now see it played out, where they couldn't be bothered in the slightest to talk about uh, past Nigerian Standing Committee meetings would have a statement about, oh well, we reject the LLF uh, decisions by the House of Bishops and this and that. Because that's this is the first standing committee since that meeting. Nothing, because they couldn't care anymore. They don't mm -hmm. review the Church of England as a Christian institution. They view Anglicans and members of the Church of England as Christians, okay. yeah. but they so, do well, not believe the institution is fit for service. They're still pro Gafcon, and you know, absolutely. So, but you know, it's interesting because uh, you and I uh, attended next meeting itis for you know 10, 15 years. We would go to all these different events where Roland Williams at the time was going to help direct the communion back from the innovations of the Episcopal Church and the Canadian Church, now the Church of England, and that never happened. And I think Nigerians and other African uh, provinces have just grown tired and grown weary of this. Um, and they don't have next meeting itis anymore because they know that the solution of this cannot be found in Canterbury, the solution this will not be found with the Church of England. The solution may be found with GAFCON and other uh, entities, but it's certainly nowhere to be found with, uh, we're, we're, how, how we started. We're, we're seeing the, the phrase demography is destiny played out. Mm -hmm. That the, there are Anglican parts of the Anglican world that are thriving, that are growing, that are adding people. 
And then there are parts that are withering on the vine. We've talked recently episodes about the Anglican Church of Canada. Um, the Church of England was all excited because they had attendants come back at the cathedrals. They put out this big puff piece about how more people are coming back. We're almost to pre-COVID, but not quite. What you had to read further down was that baptisms um, have just collapsed and have not come back. So you, whether the Japanese tourists have returned and are now attending on Sunday, but the actual true measure of church health, of baptisms and con conversions and things like that, that has just not come back since COVID. So that the, the church is in, a, is, is in a tailspin right now, the Church of England as an institution. Well, because in our next story, we learn that they don't know who God is. According to Justin Welby, God is green, and those of you who deny climate change are, are anti-Christian. Now, George and I do not deny that climate is changing. Climate has always changed. Uh, as one of our uh, viewers po pointed out, You know, climate is a 30-year measure of what you see outside, and I absolutely agree. I use climate as more of something speaking to a world audience. Uh, what climate is is saying when I talk about guns, I had to use a, a, a bigger identifier than uh, just saying a, a, a model of gun. Now, in this, George, um, I do deny the amount of human participation in climate change that Justin Welby thinks I should have. And I, I think you, you are the same. The, the, the numbers aren't there that uh, carbon is doing it. The only extremely measurable thing that's happened in the last climate cycle, 30 years, is the humidity has increased significantly. <laughs> so I don't know what to do with, with Justin Welby. Let's just talk about kicking people out of church because they don't like climate change, George. Yeah, Justin Welby had an editorial in The Independent on Sunday. Yeah. And he's denying climate. Those who deny uh, man-made climate change mm -hmm. is where Welby's coming from, are anti-Christian. Well, then he, I'm not a Christian because I deny man-made climate change. It's not that I say it's not happening. I just say you cannot know. There is no, in other words, mo what we have are models that predict. And just like we have uh, the hurricane models predicting where this hurricane is going to come, at the end of the day, nobody knows where it's going to land because the models change. The same models, the models we used 30 years ago, you know, where Al Gore, you know, said that the polar bears by 2006, the Arctic ice would right, be gone. Go yeah. Prince Charles telling us that, you know, massive famine would break out. Uh, because of the increase of CO2. Well, the increase of CO2, we've never seen greater crop yields of corn and rice in human history in the recent years. I'm saying that we do not know that it is impossible to measure consistently over time climate. You put in a, uh, a measuring facility and if the suburbs go out to your country spot, then you'll have a heat sink where, you know, concrete and uh, buildings cause the temperature to rise just naturally. Uh, not anything to do with the climate, just where you've got the measuring device. Well, I my, my, what I deny is that we can measure effectively over time climate. I, I disagree that this is the climate that is st is uh, what uh, static. That right now having uh, ninety five or ninety degrees during the summer and thirty five degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry for our foreign viewers. Uh, here in North America is static. I think just from visually uh, looking what happened with glaciers. You know where I am right now. Uh, Two thousand. 20,000 years ago, there was a glacier two and a half miles high right here in Maryland. Okay. Where you grew up in Pennsylvania, there was a glacier five miles high, uh, you know, 20,000 years ago. How do we know that that was the, not the stag static time in our history? And that's the desired temperature of the earth. 
you know. And so I, you know, prove that. No, no, well, no, well, be you know. He says, quote, it dismays me when I hear Christians disputing scientific facts. Uh, well, I think it, I think it was uh, Pe Daniel Patrick Moynihan says that uh, we can dis we can dis we ha we can disagree on interpretation, but we you can't have your own set of facts. Yeah. And there is no set of facts that un d demonstrates Welby's viewpoint. There are opinions based on facts. Well, so now he, he, he himself is anti-scientific. He's anti-intellectual. He's anti-logical. He's also a bit of a fool for substituting the living Lord Jesus Christ for the green agenda. Yes, but back when Obama first became president and they came out with this false statistic that 97% of scientists believe in climate change, we are now to the point where only like 53% of scientists believe in human uh, climate change. That, that percentage is slowly going up because they're finally being asked to look at the numbers. They're finally being asked to, 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 to explain our history. And to explain, like the uh, the Middle Ages, when we had a a a, uh, um, a mini when the Vikings uh, got repelled, uh, cold time. I mean, it's just ice age. Yeah, ice age. Sorry. Yeah. You see, I've not drank enough coffee, George. Hold on. So, and is well, and is that you know, science is something you always challenge. That's how you get better science. Otherwise, I, well, well, I, I, my family would have got lobotomies years ago. Well, be, <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> well, well, be's, you know, well, be's fantasies are, are his own concern. And really, you know, he can believe what he wants. It's, you mm. know, nothing to do with me. Uh, but when he's backing the net zero plans again for the Church of England and the Labour government's 2030 plans for net zero, now, this basically calls for the deindustrialization of England. Let's move all the steel mills from Wales to India. India. Let's, yeah. you know, let's uh, basically take away manufacturing and we can all live in, in the suburbs with our Teslas and uh, be happy. Well, net zero is nonsense. You know, if you basically want poverty and cold and you want to take medieval buildings that were uh, and go back to a time when uh, they're spending inordinate sums of money for something that will not change anything and will not improve the life of the Church of England. Instead, it will satisfy a political agenda. That is mismanagement on a massive scale. And that's the big truth here. They say that you know, even if we stopped everything, all fossil fuels this year, uh, we could only affect in the next uh, 300 years the temperature by point a uh, tenth of a degree or something like that. That you know uh, we are beyond the point where humans can de-affect the climate. This is according to climate change experts. Now the, there used to always be this 12-year uh, uh, measurement in 12 years. This is going to happen. We'll we'll lose the Arctic, or we'll lose the Antarctic, or this uh, this big iceberg will fall off the in Antarctica. It will flood the Earth. Uh, they keep making these predictions that never happen. Now we're down to in this last week. They're doing five year predictions. If we can't fix it in five years, it's, we're done. That's it. And I'm like, yeah, but. And we also <laughs> we're we're also in a world where experts have lost their. Uh, Cachet, their validity. Yeah, they. We had uh, Dr. Burks, the scarf lady, uh, who we all saw during the pandemic times with Dr. Fauci. Yeah. She appeared before a congressional committee uh, last week, and she was asked about the vaccines. And she said, she said, and she was asked, now when you said vaccines were safe and effective, did you have any evidence to that, or how? Why did you make that claim? She said, well, we hoped they would be. Mm -hmm. We hoped they would be, and so we said they would be, hoping that we would be right. So what she essentially said was that they lied for ideological purposes. And we see that lying taking place across science in so many different ways that it has no validity. Uh, 
you know, if you don't, you know, now we we see that though you know those who were vaccinated are far worse off medically than those who were unvaccinated. But we were told that uh, it was safe and effective, and it was a lie. I, I well, I do know that my my second booster caused a six month return of my diabetes, which is finally going now again. Um, yeah, I mean, when it comes to science, you always need to challenge science. That's how you get better science. Now, there, there's this website. People go, Kevin, how do you know so much about climate? I don't know a lot about climate. But there's people out there who I trust. Uh, and I, I do try and read up on uh, what I can. And uh, Judith Curry is, um, is probably the most accomplished climate scientist uh, in the last 20 or 30 years. And these are tough articles to read because they're beyond my scientific comprehension. Here, here's an extension of linear carbon sink model temperature matters, roles of humans in global water cycle and impacts on climate change, implications of linear car carbon sink model, uh, volcano. She goes into all this different research. And if you get a chance and you, you want to know where Kevin uh, gets his his uh his information. Uh, Judith is one of the many people I, I follow. Can I read and understand everything she writes? No, because she's a scientist and I'm just a, a, a lowly commentator and influencer on YouTube. George, we've, we've uh, certainly uh, alienated some of our, our folks who think that the climate is destroying, that humans are destroying the climate. Let's move on and talk about some other things out there. Uh, Story number five, four bishops backed by Welby condemned land seizures in the West Bank. And before we get to the story, let's just talk about the last two weeks between uh, Israel, Gaza, and Israel, Hezbollah. I'm glad I am never going to go to war with the Mossad. And I want to talk about the difference of intel with the Mossad and Gaza and Mossad and Hezbollah. The Mossad know a whole heck of a lot about what was going on and, and who their enemy was with the Hezbollah, where they kind of lost contact and ability to know what was ha happening in, in Gaza. Uh, what, what a difference intelligence makes, George. Yeah, they've had this recent wave electronic uh, preemptive War, attacks yeah. on yeah. Hezbollah uh, people. We've had the usual people uh, complain, oh, this is a war crime because innocent civilians have been killed. No, no innocent civilians were killed. If you had a Hezbollah page or a cell phone, you were a Hezbollah reservist, and that's how you were called out. Mm -hmm. And so instead of getting your call-up papers in the mail, you got a text report and do this or that. Well, Israel uh, intercepted the, uh, the uh, pagers and phones and walkie-talkies that Hezbollah purchased. And... Uh, Put, uh, did something to them. I'm not quite sure. I don't understand the science. But uh, yeah, they put, they put they little uh, explode. Yeah, little capsules of C4 in them, and uh, enough of a, a degree of C4 that they didn't need a detonator. Really, they were able to use the battery for it, and they somehow were able to send a signal to these uh, pagers to set off that uh, detonation. And I like. And when I heard about this, I'm like. Wow, you've just taken out the reserve force of Hezbollah and you've taken out their ability to communicate with each other. They're going to start to gather somewhere. The, the leadership of these people are going to start to gather. And so Mossad and, and the Israel Defense Forces obviously knew that. And then they took out the leadership by bombing where they met together, George. Yeah. And, and like, so, so Hezbollah and Israel are in a, in a war right now. Uh, mm -hmm. It's being fought right now by missiles. Hezbollah is launching thousands of missiles, which Israel, by and large, is knocking down with their Iron Dome anti-missile defense. Some missiles have landed. Uh, Nazareth has been hit several times. So we've got uh, we've got a war about to break out, and this was the uh, this was the weekend as war is coming that four bishops of the Church of England, backed by Justin Welby, decide to side with. Hezbollah and condemn Israel. Uh, four bishops, uh, Rachel Trawick of Loster, uh, Guli Francis de Cani of, uh, of uh, Chelmsford, uh, the Bishop of Southwark, 
and I think the Bishop of Norwich, I'm not sure, but four of them, uh, put out a letter that was printed in The Guardian, specifically attacking Israel as an oppressor state for seizing the land and dem demolishing a restaurant and house belonging to a Palestinian. And so they laid out the facts that this house was taken unlawfully and illegally and demolished unlawfully and illegally and how evil the Israelis are. And here's the problem. The bishops were absolutely ignorant of the facts. Rule number one when dealing in the Middle East is don't believe anything you're told. And, and when you're dealing with the, uh, uh, the Anglican Church in Jerusalem, especially don't believe anything. These people lie yeah, uh, all the time when we talk about international and Israeli politics. These are the people who told us about the deliberate strike on the hospital. These are the people who told us about the Janine massacre. These, you can't believe the Diocese of Israel. And I say this from 30 years reporting on them. They will follow the Hezbollah Hamas line without exception. What are the facts? Well, Mich uh, Melanie Phillips had an article and in her Substack, and there's plenty of Israeli news if you wanted to look into this and actually see what was going on. There was a long drawn out legal case where a squatter on land purchased by an Israeli charity in the 60s squatted on this land, built a house, it was torn down after court order, and finally went all the way to the Israeli Supreme Court and the Israeli Supreme Court said, yes, this land belongs to the people who hold title and have the bill of sale. All you say is that you inherited this land, but you have no proof that your family ever owned it or lived there. And so they gave the order to allow the sheriff or whoever the equivalent is to pull down this squatters buildings on the Israeli land and pay damages to the Israeli entity. So the bishops are totally ignorant of this fact that all they did is listen to the complaints and immediately jumped to the conclusion that Israelis bad, Palestinians good. Now I've asked Lambeth Palace and Bishop Trawick, what do you say to the charges that you basically made a fool of yourself? That you jumped before actually knowing the facts and you're defending squatters uh, who have tried to use the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a cloak to steal somebody else's land. Of course, they've not answered. Not answered, huh? <laughs> and this isn't just the fog of war. This is, uh, you know, a, a group of people who thought for sure they could steal land, and uh, uh, they can because they have people who will defend it. Hey, which dog is that? That's Tara. 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 It's a little girl. Somebody dropping off clothing. Oh boy. Tara. Come here, Pooch. Hello. Tara. Hello. Tara. Yes, pretty girl. Yeah. You sit down. You protect you protect the boys. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh last story. Then we get to talk about fun stuff. No, actually, we're 40 minutes in. We may not get everything. Uh, I got contacted yesterday by uh, one of our uh, uh, unscripted viewers. Uh, his name is Justin. I'm not going to give his last name because they don't have permission to. And he said, did you see well, that they... they wasn't Justin, Justin Welby. No, Welby. not Justin. Well, he's certainly oh. a viewer, clearly. But, uh, um, and he said, did you see that... Uh, uh, C4SO has taken off their, their Twitter page. The, you can't find the profile anymore. And so has Todd Hunter. I said, I didn't know that. But you, for me, that's not a big story because uh, the less social media you put yourself into, the, the better you probably are uh, as a You, you, don't, uh, a, you a don't think there's any connection with the P. Diddy case? You don't think they went? Todd Hunter went to these parties? Do you know? No, I don't. Okay. I, I know Todd. I, I, I assure you, you did not go to these parties. Uh, Todd is a, a, a decent person, a good bishop who has a few uh, doctrinal issues and problems, but we'll yeah, you know, whatever. So, however, the 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 gentleman Justin also said, "Did you know that there's another parish that has left the C4SO and has left the uh, the ACNA now?" Uh, and I said, "I did not." And he gave me the the link to this church. Oops, I don't have that link up. And I said, "Well, we're going to have to talk about this, George. Another church has lost left the ACNA." 
I only came out to this after you forwarded me the text you received, and I received one from the, the fellow you received it from. Yeah. And I looked at the parish, and it looked to be a bit of a social justice parish. Yeah. And looked at some of its activities, and I probably think they made a wise choice because they, what was important to them isn't important to the ACNA, social justice and whatnot. Well, so, if you go to the, the, their mission statement, um, it's a little bit different than a gospel mission st uh, statement. It said, Christ our peace, Anglican Church, uh, and this is in, in Illinois, seeks to engage with our neighborhood through faithful action rooted in God's shalom. We are committed to creating a room for sustained justice by investing in, partnering with, and opening doors for meaningful connections while valuing and nurturing the, nurturing the whole person. Um Okay, uh, nothing there about uh, making disciples or uh, fellowshipping or uh, bringing glory to God. And so I probably a good bet that they uh, move on. Um, now, this is not yeah. the first church we've seen move, George. Yeah, and no, no mention of Jesus. Um, Duh, well. That, but so... Is this a big deal? No, it's no. probably it probably actually shows the health of the the ACNA because they can they have uh, mechanisms that allow people who frankly do not fit into the vision and ethos of the ACNA to withdraw without years of litigation and grief. And so good for the ACNA that they have these things set up because not everybody uh, who identifies as an Anglican who's not an Episcopalian wants you know, identifies with the ACNA's uh, vision. And you, <laughs> yes, girl. And you shouldn't try to fit round holes into square pegs. No. And, I mean, this is a wheat and chaff thing. I mean, not every parish should be uh, in Acta Parish. And this clearly, when I, I watched a couple of her sermons, and I'm like, oh, she's... Well, I said enough. You, if you want to go watch a couple of her sermons and have her uh, give you a trigger warning before she reads Psalm thirty-one, Proverbs thirty-one, that's completely up to you. Um, uh, not all Acne parishes are uh, the same. And George says, "Well, this is just another C four S parish." And I said, "There probably are more C four S parishes like this, but I've traveled enough now in our nation and visited almost every diocese." And every diocese has a less than parish, shall we say, but they don't have a voice in the diocese. They don't get to speak and make uh, decisions, but there's always the, the one or two where they're just a, a little on the, the iffy side. Um, I think C4SO has more iffy parishes than your average diocese. But I don't want to say this is only a C4SO problem because I go to a C4S church, which is not an iffy church. Okay, George. Um, hey, we got a couple minutes here. How about politics here in America? Pretty crazy. Well, it seems like normal now <laughs> these days. Yeah, it's just, it uh, does. It's crazy. In fact, here's the headline I, I woke up to. Um, Cam Camilla Harris uh, gave a quote, and here, here she she says, "I worked my ass off working for Willie Brown." I like, okay. We get it. We got it. We got it. Whatever. You know, uh, I don't know what's going to happen in November. I know that the, the, the race is drawing closer. I know that uh, uh, half the time Trump is not helping himself with the stuff he says in our in our nation's populace. Uh, and I know half the time Camilla is not saying stuff that's helping herself. Um, it's just a strange time, George, to watch these two candidates together. I've now decided who I'm going to vote for. I'm not going to tell you guys because you guys, you know, you hate me already. But uh, uh, in as such, um, I don't think I know a time in American politics where it has been this strange, but I'm only 50, 60 years old. Have, have you, do you recall anything like this in your past? Because you're like five years older no. than me. <laughs> no, uh, but, you know, God looks after fools, drunks in the United States of America. Yeah, and we yes. shall pass through this time. Yeah. Um, the uh, 
I live in a silo in the sense that I live in a part of the world, part of the United States, that there's only one candidate running effectively. Sure. Uh, there's All no right. advertisement. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, you know, there's no political advertising on the TV. There's nothing, you know, signs up. If there are signs, there's signs in people's yards as you drive by. Mm -hmm. And I've yet to see a Harris sign. But that's just, I, I, you know, I, but I don't live in New, I don't live in California, New England. Where but I I'm here. In, I'm here. In, I'm here in Maryland, which is a Democrat-run uh, state, has a uh, Democrat governor, has voted for the last, uh, you know, two hundred years of Democrat pre uh, presidential candidates, and I still see more Trump signs uh, than hair signs, like uh, a number of twenty to one. That does not mean Maryland is going to go for Trump. It just means that uh, there's more excitement or whatever for the candidate that is Donald than for the candidate that is Kamala. In as such, I think the youth vote by a large number are going to vote for Kamala. Am I saying that name right? I, I think for, so. For Mrs. Yes. Harris. Yeah, that's uh, her. Okay. <laughs> I can do Harris. I actually, actually, I disagree with you on, mm -hmm. on that. Uh, and again, You're welcome I can only to. look that uh, what we saw in Germany, for instance, um, they've had three uh, provincial elections and the AFD, the Alliance for Deutschland, the conservative party, has won the youth vote because they've rejected the whole woke agenda. My two of my, my two children were Bernie bros uh, at one time. They're both con rather liberal on many issues. But they would not vote for Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't, and they like. Uh, I just don't see there being a natural affinity there. Now we don't talk politics in our family, but they have expressed dislike for Kamala Harris. Sure. And silence over Donald Trump. Yeah. So right. I just, I just don't, I because what they dislike is the the wokeness and the they're at the age they want to marry manly men and the democratic party is seems to be the party of cat ladies and they don't want to be cat ladies I know. yeah it, it now i'll give you that there's interest i mean all three of my kids are most definitely going to vote for kamala uh because they they are into the book currently into the book agenda um, my oldest is becoming more conservative every day because she's paying more and more taxes every day. And uh, she is not pleased by how her taxes aren't solving the problems she thought government should solve. Will she ever vote for a candidate like Trump? I don't know. Uh, my oldest child's number one concern is abortion. She wants to be sure that all women have access to abortion. And uh, I... Yeah, she wasn't raised that way. Sorry, people, but uh, she's allowed to believe what she wants to believe in my family. Uh, so, I don't know. We shall see what happens, George. Shall be interesting. I hey, look at that. Fifty-eight minutes. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm George Conger, and you've been listening to Tara and <laughs> Jasper and Julius for episode eight hundred and eighty-one of Anglican Unscripted.